Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, so my work is um, well, my review is on the thermal metallomechanical modelling of heat treatment induced residual stress in titanium alloy Ti64. Um, so Ti64 is the um, most popular titanium alloy um, in the world today, um, predominantly because of its um, alpha beta um, phase composition, and this can be um, this can essentially be manipulated to produce microstructures um, with uh, varying uh, different property, uh, final properties based on your thermal mechanical um, thermal mechanical processes that, that are chosen beforehand. So, um, why model residual stress? So, residual stresses um, are essentially stresses which remain on a part um, once it's um, it's not. Um, it's not exhibit any external influences. Um, so predominantly these are, arise due to thermal, mechanical and metallurgical misfits uh, with, uh, within the park. Um, and this can be over a number of length scales, um, going from uh, the atomic scale up to um, the macro scale. And in terms of uh, metalworking, uh, we tend to consider um, these smaller scale um, about smaller length scales, but um, on a more important note, um, these macro scale stresses um, are what's um, what's most important um, when we're looking at um, machining um, and um, the general processing itself. Um, so when we're mo well, and we need to model this um, in order to kind of ascertain what the best um, process parameters are for the mitigation of residual stress, because if you have residual stress in a uh, component, um, this can lead to um, reduced fatigue life, for example, um, and also um, you can get distortion during machining, uh, which leads to uh, material wastage uh, and uh, rework, which is costly to uh, any of the manufacturers, and this leads through the supply chain. Um, and in order to uh, model this, um, for example, in finite element software, um, you consider uh, these three uh, origins of residual stress, uh, your thermal, mechanical, and metallurgical components, and um, you can simplify this into three submodels, which are um, interrelated um, by, um, by a number of uh, factors, for instance. Um, and often what you can do is simplify um, the, these interactions based on, um, based on the process and the material that you're looking at. For example, during heat treatment, um, heat generation is minimal, um, whereas on the other hand, if we're looking at forging applications, you might have to uh, take that into account. Um, and the residual stress is computed uh, usually through um, uh, applying like infinitesimal strain theory, um, and in this process, the strain is uh, kind of reduced into a number of um, com components based on the kind of origins. So, for example, you have this mechanical submodel, which is comprised of uh, creep strain, uh, viscoplastic and plastic strain, and also your elastic strain. Mm -hmm. um, you have a thermal model, uh, which looks at uh, thermal, um, thermally induced strains, um, and some people consider um, transformation induced volumetric strain as well within this model, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later, that's why it's highlighted here. Um, and thirdly, we're looking at the metallurgical submodel um, and that. Um, Purely said here that this is looking at transformation induced plasticity strain, um, which is um, something that hasn't really been um, investigated in much detail for titanium alloys. Um, so, typical processing routes for Ti64 um, you have um, a beta anneal um, up here, which is typically used for um, large scale forgings, for, exist uh, for, for example, in landing gear. Um, and this um, involves you seating it above the beta transist with a slow uh, cooling rate afterwards. Um, and this is the kind of typical microstructure you can, um, you can expect from this. Um, but probably most importantly in terms of residual stress prediction um, and um, analysis is um, the solution treatment and aging, which is um, often um, conducted slightly below the beta transist, um, for example at 950 degrees. Uh, followed by water quenching, and this water quench um, uh, induces um, high thermal gradient, uh, large thermal gradients, 
Um, I know you also have this Martin safe transformation when you have the high cooling rates in this, uh, in this region. Um, and for that reason, uh, aging is often conducted um, to um, get rid of this brittle Martin Cytic phase um, and also for um, some stress relief. Um, and this is the bimodal microstructure you may, um, you may, it's characteristic of this uh, solution treatment in aging, um, but also um, not shown here is the Martin Cytic microstructure, which is uh, shown within the paper. Um, so going on to the thermal submodel. Um, the big question here is, should you use this micro or lattice parameter based um, thermal expansion coefficient um, in terms of um, your, your thermal submodel in order to get the, this thermally, uh, the thermal uh, component of strain? Um, quite often in uh, models you use the, this kind of macro uh, thermal expansion which is gathered from dilatometry um, and this is an example here um, of um, the linear thermal expansion coefficient used um, for Pi64. However, if you want to break it down into last parameter based model, you can look at um, the alpha beta phases um, kind of individually um, and base your um, your thermal expansion on uh, the expansion um, of each uh, of the unit cell volume. Um, this is well. This has been measured by synchrotron X-ray diffraction um, by Elmer, um, and also what was found in this work is um, this this strain, uh, this kind of transformation in just volume strain um, in the alpha to beta phase transformation. Um, so I think that. Here is the kind of expansion coefficients gathered in this data here. Um, so, I mean, what you really see from this is that, um, I mean, it doesn't. I don't really think it really matters which um, thermal expansion coefficient you you choose this micro, uh, macro, or lattice parameter based. But um, it's important that you take into account um, which one you're using, rather than, uh, for example, saying that you're taking. Um, your transformation induced uh, volume change strain and your thermal um, your thermal strain and you're using both this macro and lattice parameter based because then you're counting it um, twice so it's making it um, redundant and you're, you're losing accuracy overall. Um, so next on to this kind of metallurgical submodel. Um, in terms of like the, the alpha beta transformation and Ti64, there are a number of um, morphologies which can be created depending on your your cooling rate from um, high in the uh, alpha beta phase field. So, for instance, in this region here. Um, so, this leads to a number of complexities uh, if you're trying to compute the, the final microstructure. Um, because, the, well, there's a lot of variation here, and this is just uh, some, uh, uh, some example literature data. Some of it is experimental, uh, some of it is more analytical based. But, um, the big thing to take away here, there is some variation, and this is as you would really expect because there's so much variation in the alloy chemistry. I mean, you're talking plus or minus uh, up to 1% in your um, aluminium and vanadium, which act as alpha and beta stabilizers, and this can um, obviously affect the, the final microstructure you end up with. But of particular note in this kind of, in the metallurgical component, is your beta to um, Martin site transformation, which is diffusionless. Um, and occurs during um, your uh, water quenching um, on the external. So the transformation induced plasticity is this component that um, I was going to I said we talk about within this metallurgical submodel, um, and of most um, importance to the um, to the residual <coughs> stress is this Greenwood Johnson effect, um, and that is plastic accommodation of thermal strain below the apparent elastic limit. So you're essentially, what's happening at what, um, when you have this transformation induced plasticity is you're, re you're essentially relieving residual stress um, whilst the martensitic transformation is occurring. Um, and the thing that's really quite problematic about this is that, um, that there's no consensus on a martensitic start temperature. So for example, it ranges from um, 575 at 850 degrees um, in published literature. Um, and what that means is if you're um, quenching from 950 degrees, this uh, accommodation of the thermal strain is going to occur at 850 based on Sienowski's work. Um, but then if you took into account Ahmed and Rack, this is happening a lot later 
um, in the cooling process, so therefore it's going to um, accommodate more thermal strain. Um, in terms of the, the mechanical submodel, um, what we have here is you, know, you can essentially lump your viscoplastic and plastic um, strain together if you take in a, a strain rate dependent flow stress um, and your elastic. Um, your elastic strain can be taken into account if you uh, use Young's modulus. Um, the main thing uh, within this mechanical submodel, in terms of the vis this is a viscoplastic model, um, well, comparison, um, although it's only one strain rate shown here, um, what I'm really comparing this uh, figure is um, kind of the use of empirical models and the use of physically based models. Um, and what really um, st strikes um, strikes me is that you have, um, for example, this line here, um, which cuts off um, at this point, this is a Johnson Cook model, um, and it begins to kind of lose validity when you compare against like the, the data points from experimental work um, once you go above 600 degrees. Um, and then similarly, if we look at Semyatin's work, who was looking at uh, forging conditions, so kind of like above um, 600 uh, degrees up to about 900 here, that kind of holds well in this region, but then when, you, when you're reducing temperature, um, it doesn't, it kind of loses validity. Yeah, if, if you take into account a physically based model, which is able to accurately describe the mechanisms that are taking place um, throughout the whole temperature range, you do end up, uh, you do end up, um, well, having good agreement with um, experimental data. Uh, next on to uh, this uh, creep strain component. Um, so that's often uh, gathered through stress relaxation testing, for example. Um, and the way you do that is you would, um, you would carry out a tensile test, uh, essentially to, uh, under a constant strain rate regime, um, to predefined strain, um, and then hold it at that strain for the duration of your test. From that, you get stress relaxation. You can convert that um, into um, stress decay rate, um, and then um, using uh, this uh, formula here, uh, that can be uh, converted into the creep strain, uh, creep strain rate, using an apparent um, Young's modulus. Um, and then, basically, if we compare the work of uh, Alibort and Lee, um, you can see that um, on increasing temperature, there is some, um, some significant deviation um, between the authors and They've actually looked at similar um, initial microstructures here. So it's not clear why there, this deviation has occurred, <coughs> and I think that is an area for, um, that, that would be great for future work um, to, to investigate this further, because it could be due to um, the initial strain rate um, and the, the kind of pre test regime um, or the strain that, that the authors um, conducted the test at. Um, on some model validation. So, in terms of um, validation of your test results, um, it's obviously extremely important because otherwise you don't know um, if, your, if your model is accurately describing um, and what, what's actually occurring in the process. Um, in order to do that, you have to measure the residual stress. Well, you don't have to measure residual stress, but as this is the you, know, you can also look at um, deflection for <coughs> your machining and then compare that. But, as the focus of this review is on residual stress, um, I'm going to talk about the kind of validation by residual stress measurement. Um, so you have two kind of major um, residual stress uh, kind of measurement uh, methodologies. You can either look at um, kind of um, non-destructive in terms of uh, diffraction based, or you can look at destructive, which is um, kind of you you're applying a you're, you're essentially releasing the stresses and measuring the stress relaxation and um, and uh, kind of re reverse calculating what, what the, uh, the initial stress was. Um, so th there are a number of techniques available, um, but some of them have limitations. For example, lab-based um, extra diffraction um, can only um, can only penetrate tens of uh, micron. Um, so it's it's really good for kind of surface based measurements. So um, so the example is kind of the right in the surface here um, and over here. This is um, XRD based. Um, 
Also, you can look at the semi-destructive um, hole drilling methods, which kind of go a little bit deeper, but they don't penetrate the bulk of the material. And also, um, these um, through-thickness um, techniques, such as the contour method, um, which gives you a really good two-dimensional um, understanding of the residual stress distribution in the, in the park. So, in terms of um, selection of uh, the of technique, it totally depends on what you're interested in. If you're only interested in, um, say, surface residual, well, surface and near surface residual stress, then XRD and hole drilling um, or similar techniques um, may be um, of, of use. Whereas um, if you're looking at um, bulk um, through thickness, uh, such as in um, such as in like uh, bulk forming applications. Um, then the contour method and other methods like uh, deep hole drilling might be um, the best choice. Um, so in terms of uh, the work that's out there, I've kind of simplified, um, it's, it's quite hard to read that, I apologise, but I've simplified um, like the, what the, the authors have done um, and their kind of methodology and kind of based on my literature review I've identified what I deem as best practice from from what is out there. So in terms of your metallurgical model, if you use, uh, <coughs> for instance, uh, JMAC and Koisten and Marburger um, type relations for to to um, to model your your diffusion and um, non-diffusional um, based um, transformations, and um, this is kind of the, the best best practice. Um, and also using the, the Greenwood and Johnson um, type. Uh, model for transformation induced plasticity. However, when we look at the thermal model, um, in terms of um, using experimental based um, data for heat transfer coefficient, um, and also using a potentially phase based or a macro thermal expansion, then this can, um, this can be, um, give you a good approximation for your thermal model. Um, and then for example, uh, there was only one paper here which kind of used um, equation-based um, prediction for the mechanical, for all mechanical um, mechanical components. Um, so that's kind of the best you can have here. However, there are obviously some um, limitations in that only Johnson Cook was used for the pl uh, plasticity, um, and obviously, as I've said previously. Um, the physically based model um, is, is better for, for these applications for over the whole temperature range. Um, and in terms of validation technique, um, really, um, as I've said, it's, it's more or less dependent on your, your process and um, the, the actual, uh, than, than the techniques themselves. So, I mean, that's totally up to uh, the user as long as they, they're aware of what's out there. Um, and yeah, so the conclusions are um, that it should be ensured that your thermal expansion coefficients um, and transformation induced volume change components are used accordingly um, in order to uh, prevent any um, any kind of duplications. Um, and also further investigation of transformation induced plasticity, plasticity in titanium alloys should be conducted um, as this is particularly lacking, although there's been a lot of work in this area for steels. Um, and yeah, the stress relaxation behaviour um, should also be studied in further detail as this is uh, quite important in terms of ageing um, and annealing applications um, and uh, there's little quantitative data on this um, and little application of this um, in, for predictive means. Um, and also uh, the final takeaway is to uh, use complementary uh, residual stress measurement techniques um, in order to have a full understanding of what's actually going on. That's...